While all of that's going on, one of Jesus' top followers, one of his most loyal devotees named Peter, was in the courtyard, and a little girl walks up and says, you're not following Jesus too, and do you remember what Peter says? He goes, no, 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 I'm not following Jesus. He denies Jesus, and he denies Jesus not only once, not only twice, but he denies Jesus three times. It's insane. It's wild. And in fact, everything leading up to this point has been incredibly wild. In fact, the word to describe everything that we have seen the last two to three weeks can be summed up in one word, and that one word would be unfair. The process that Jesus was being held to, the events that were taking place were against Roman law. They were against Jewish tradition. And everything about this situation was unfair. But Jesus knew what it was that he was supposed to do which takes us to where we are at in our story today. In the portion of the text that we're going to be looking at, we're going to meet an unlikely individual, a person who in many ways wants nothing to do with Jesus, and this person's name is Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate. Now, who is Pontius Pilate? I think the best place to start with this guy, Pontius Pilate, is with his name. Pontius literally means skilled with a javelin. And I'm not talking about track and field. I'm talking about a sharp one thrown at enemies. Roman warfare kind of guy. Now, what do we know about this guy? Well, a few things. First, we know that Pontius was a brave military man. When he was a youth, he led raids to the north for the empire of Rome and was brave, courageous, valiant, conquered different enemies, raided different tribes, expanded the empire of Rome. He was a brave man. We also know from the writings of historians such as Josephus and Philo that Pontius came from an elite family a family that had a lot of influence, a family that was very close with the current emperor, which was named Tiberius. And so Pontius Pilate was this fearless man who was skilled in many ways. He was unafraid to cause pain. He was brutal. He was passionate. And as Pontius continued to grow up, he chose the right woman for his career aspirations. Isn't it funny? This is the second week in a row a guy has married a really good woman Right? Remember Annas? He married a, a very impactful lady who allowed him to progress in his career. And then we look at Pontius Pilate, and the same was true with him. Who did he marry? He married a woman by the name of Claudia Procula. I don't know about you, but it sounds like Dracula's like, wife or something. Claudia Procula. And who was this woman? Well, Claudia Procula was the granddaughter of Emperor Augustus, which made her Roman royalty which means that Pontius was married to royalty, and with this new bride and his reputation of brutality, the current emperor, which was named Tiberius, thought that there could be no better person to rule over the most contentious region of the Roman Empire. You say, what region is that? Well, that is the region known as Judea. Judea started on the east coast of the Mediterranean Sea and extended all the way to the west, encompassing the region around Jerusalem. And you say, Austin, why was Judea such a tense area. Well, here's why. Because there were a lot of very proud Jewish people in this area. And the Jewish people wanted their own nation state. They wanted their own uh, nation, their own country, very much like it is today in Israel, a Jewish state. And the Jewish people also had a history of rebelling against the, the, the people that were currently occupying their space. Think back to 167 B.C., We talked about this earlier when Jesus' triumphal entry. Think of um, the Maccabean revolt which took place and how uh, the Maccabees rolled in and they went against the Seleucid Empire and they kicked them out of town and they sort of codified their own nation state there in Israel. And, And that same zeal and that same patriotism in this region of Judea still existed today. And so because of this, Tiberius said, I need someone who can rule with an iron fist. I need someone who has a silver tongue, who can speak in such a way to make sure that he maintains order. But I also need someone with brutality. I need someone who's not willing to, who who is willing to spill blood. And so he thought to himself, what better person would there be than Pontius Pilate? And so Pontius Pilate, sure enough, was sent to this region of Judea, and he governed this region from AD 26 to AD 36, 10 years. Now, that's fascinating. Why did Pontius Pilate rule the region of Judea as governor for 10 years, because this is out of the ordinary. You see, being a governor at this time normally was a one to three year commitment. In other words, the emperor would say, you're gonna go to this spot and you're gonna be there one to three years. But Pontius Pilate stayed in Judea for 10 years. That's a long time. Why? Well, it's because he was good at his job. He kept order. He maintained peace. 
He was able to negotiate with the Jewish leaders in such a way that made sure that they were good, um, uh, suppressed people under the Roman Empire. But eventually, his, and his rule came to an end in Judea, and I'll tell you why. We'll jump forward 10 years to AD 36. And Pontius Pilate was sitting in his mansion, which was on the Mediterranean Sea. It's pretty cool. Being governor of this region gave you a place at the Fort of Antonia, which overlooked the Mediterranean Sea. It's a beautiful place. It's been dug up archaeologically today, and you can go see it. It's, a, it's an incredible spot. So he's sitting in his mansion overlooking the Mediterranean Sea, and he's told that there's a group of Samaritans that were gathering on top of Mount Gerizim. And he was notified about this, and he kind of whimsically made an order for Roman soldiers to march up Mount Gerizim and slaughter them. Now, they don't really know why this happened. There's no real good documentation, but sure enough, the Roman soldiers march up. They slaughter the Samaritans. And then the Samaritan people go, whoa, 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 why are you doing this? They send word back to Rome. Tiberius gets word of this, and then he sends and says, hey, Pontius, you're done. And he marched back to Rome, and 10 years later, in AD 46, he ended up committing suicide. Now, why do I share all of this stuff with you about Pontius Pilate? Here's why. It's because this man was career-focused. This man was a driven man. In many ways, he was an overachiever, a type of person that amassed an incredible amount of knowledge. He was married to royalty. He played politics well. He exercised authority swiftly and brutally. But what we're going to see from this man is something that every single one of you and I can relate to. In the story today, we're going to see Pontius Pilate ask a question that we see being asked in every single corner of our society. A question that we see being asked on social media, a question that we see being asked on the magazine racks and grocery stores, a question that we see being asked in the philosophy schools with the ivory towers and universities. And that question from Pontius Pilate is this What is truth? What is truth? You see, even a man who had power, esteem, notoriety, was asking this question, what is truth? The same question that every single one of us in this day and age is asking as well. What is true? What is false? How do I know what truth really is? And so with that in mind, that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about truth. And so, Look at verse 28 in John 18, and let's see how we get to this big question. Here's what it says. It says, Then they, the Jewish leaders, led Jesus from Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. Keep in mind, I want to mention, uh, this is in Jerusalem. And so uh, the the governor of Judea had kind of two residents. He had one over on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, which is kind of where he spent most of his time, just kind of hanging out and surfing. And then during the time of Passover, when a lot of Jews would roll into the city, he would go then over to Jerusalem where he would be. So he's kind of out of his element here, okay? He's not really in his own headquarters, you could say. He's, he's, He's a transplant at this moment. But they did not enter the headquarters themselves, otherwise they would be defiled and unable to eat Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, what charge do you bring against this man? And they answered him, if this man weren't a criminal, we wouldn't have handed him over to you. All right, this is ridiculous. So let's run it back real quick of what's going on here. Pilate just woke up out of bed. He hasn't even had his coffee. There's a group of Jewish leaders with a guy named Jesus standing before him, and they say, here he is. Here's the criminal. Pilate says, well, what did he do? And they said, well, we wouldn't have brought him to you if he didn't do something. They don't give him a reason. You see the stupidity of these people. You see just how dumb they are, bringing Jesus before them with no claim whatsoever. And look how the Jewish leaders respond. He says, if this man were a criminal, we wouldn't have handed over to you. It's such a non-answer. These guys don't know up from down. But Pilate recognizes the stupidity, and he asks them in verse 31. He says, you take him and judge him according to your law. In other words, you have no charges. You've made no claims. You've made no demands. So scram. Get out of here. But then look at what they say. It's not legal for us to put anyone to death. Bam. That right there shows us the intentions of these Jewish leaders. This right there shows us their end goal. They don't bring any charges against Jesus. They don't have any claims against Jesus. They don't even have any fault against Jesus. They essentially go to Pilate and say, what we want you to do is murder this man. On what charges? 
That's not the question. We want you to murder this man. According to Roman law, according to Jewish law, we don't have the right to kill someone, but you do. So we want you to be the executioner of the gallows and we want to send Jesus so you kill him. Now this gets the attention of Pilate. And he goes, okay, well, if these Jewish leaders really want him dead, he must have done something. What did he do? Well, look at verse 33. Then Pilate went back into headquarters. He summoned Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Now, that's a good question. And I'll tell you why that's a good question. This points to the reality that Pontius Pilate was dang good at his job. He was dang good at his job. I'll show you why. Because asking this question was a legitimate question to probe into what Jesus was doing. Because according to Roman law, if someone said that they were a king or an authority that could potentially rival the emperor, according to Roman law, they were then told to be axed, bye-bye, killed. That was Roman law. And so Pilate's probing here. He's saying, so who are you? Are you the king of the Jews? But Jesus says to them in verse 34, he says, are you asking this on your own? Or have others told you about me? And then he says, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Pilate's getting peeved. He's getting a little annoyed here. He's like, I don't want to be in these petty affairs of these Jewish people. All I want to do is send a good report back, make sure that there's no revolution taking place, and then I just want to keep living over by the sea at the base of Antonia, surfing the waves, and just living life. That's all I want to do. So he's getting annoyed. And then Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Verse 37, you are a king then, Pilate asked. I kind of envisioned Pilate kind of like walking away and then Jesus says, he's like, gotcha. So you are a king. You are a king. You, 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 you are someone who's going to lead a rebellion. This is a gotcha moment for Pilate. But then Jesus replies, you say that I'm a king. I was born for this, and I've come into the world for this. Look at this. People say, what's the purpose of Jesus? He says it right here in front of Pilate. He says, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And then look at verse 38. What does Pilate say? He says, what is truth? What is truth? I guess I envision this scene, sort of Pilate just kind of standing up and scoffing. When Jesus says all of this, he says, I came to testify of the truth. People who hear my voice will know what the truth is. And then I envision Pilate just in his pomp, in his glamour, in his power, just walking away, kind of looking back at Jesus and going, you fool. What is even truth? What is truth? And that's the question right there. What is truth? What is truth? That's the question that we've been asking for generations. That's the question that all of us want to know the answer to. And so let's talk about it. You see, I think sometimes we as Christians, especially as American Christians, like to think of the world in terms of good versus evil, right? Right versus wrong. Marvel movies, DC movies, Lord of the Rings. It's the elves, the humans, the the, the dwarves versus the evil, evil orcs. Good versus evil. This galactic battle of right versus wrong. But... I think a more helpful way and a deeper way for us to view the world is not in terms of good versus evil, but actually truth versus deception. Truth versus deception. And I want to tell you why that's so important. Because in the end, all of the evil and all of the wrongdoings that are in this world that take place, in the end, they're all summed up in one thing. It's an attack on truth. It's an attack on on truth. Just think back to the very beginning. Think back to Genesis chapter 3. Do you remember how the devil tempted Adam and Eve? Did God really say that if you ate of this tree, there would be problems? Did he really say that if you ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you would surely die? Did he really say that from the very beginning, the truth of God has been distorted into deception? You remember what Jesus says in John 8? Here's what, here's what he says. He says, the devil, he describes him so well. He says, is a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. Not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of lies. The strategy of the devil is simple. Attack that which is true. Truth matters. And this is nothing new. It's always been this. 
This has been the strategy. Attack that which is true in the form of deception. Now, we not only see this taking place in Genesis chapter 3, if we fast forward to Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah in the 8th century writes about this in Isaiah 59. Now, this verse is creepy weird, okay? I don't know about you, but I feel like this could be written about our day and age today. This is what Isaiah writes. 8th century BC, he says, So justice is driven back, and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled into streets. Honesty cannot even enter. Truth is nowhere to be found, and whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. I mean, come on. Truth isn't even allowed in the city streets. Those who are honest about the truth are cast out. This is 8th century BC, but this is also... The 21st century. This is the air we breathe. Truth is under attack. But we don't need to be scared about this. Because this is nothing new. This has always been the play. The play has always been to attack truth with deception. It's always been the play. And so for the remainder of our time today, I want to answer Pilate's question. I want to answer the question of what is truth? Because this, ma- this question really matters to you and me. It really matters to this generation. And when I was preparing for this lesson, I couldn't help but think that the, the, the truths that we're going to be talking about here are so incredibly important for us as Christians living in 2022. And so I really want you to listen closely. I have three thoughts that I want to share with you on truth. The first point is this. Number one, truth is objective. Truth is objective. Write that down. In other words, truth exists. There is a standard of truth. A phrase that we hear thrown around a lot today in our postmodern world is the phrase, my truth. Now you hear this thrown around a lot, and I'm sorry, but that is an absolute stupid phrase to use. My truth does not make sense. You can have an opinion, you can have a thought, you can have a feeling, you can even have a wish or a belief, but your thought, opinion, feeling, or belief or wish does not mean that it is true. It's very important to recognize. Truth is objective, meaning that the truth is not going to change based on your feelings or thoughts about it. It's just not going to change. And I mean, can we be honest here? Let's just talk about this very just, like, just, let's just run this out logically. Play this game with me. Imagine after church today, you say, you know what? I got to go to Costco. I got to run some errands. And so I'm going to hop on the freeway and I'm going to head over to Medford to go to Costco. Now, you're on the freeway and you all know what the speed limit is on the freeway, right? It's 65 miles per hour. And you hop on the freeway and you start heading to Medford, but you decide to go 80 miles an hour. And so you're driving along, going 80 miles an hour, thinking nothing wrong with that. I'm going to get there a little early. But what do you know? A state trooper, whew, zips up behind you, pulls you over. The state trooper is going to get out of his car. He's going to walk up to you and he's going to ask you this question. Do you have any idea how fast you were going? And you're going to say, yeah, I was going 80. I was going 80 miles an hour. He's going to say, okay, well, the speed limit is 65 miles an hour, sir. And so because you were going 15 over, I'm going to have to write you a ticket. And then if you said, whoa, 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 whoa. We see, officer, my truth, (laughs) my truth, sir, is that the speed limit is actually 80 miles an hour. What would happen then? First of all, the officer would look at you with a befuddled look on his face, and he would go, you moron. (laughs) And he would say, it doesn't matter what you feel or what your truth is. The fact is, is that the speed limit is 65. And so he'd walk back to his police car. He would text his wife immediately immediately and go, I just pulled over the biggest moron in the world, and I'm upcharging this ticket. And then he'd walk back to you. He'd slap the ticket down, and he'd say, by the way, it's 65, not 80, you dummy. And then that would be it. Or, or, or just, let's just keep playing this game out. Imagine that you have $9.22 in your bank account, okay? We've all been there. You have $9.22 in your bank account, but you walk up to the bank teller, you give them your debit card, and you say, hey, I would like to withdraw $10,000. The teller would go, okay, yeah, take your debit card, run it, open up your account, and he would say, um, okay, so slight issue, um, you have a little over nine bucks in your account. You can't withdraw $10,000. No, 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 see, 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 my truth is that I have 10 grand. My truth is that I want $10,000. The teller will look at you and say, well, you can say whatever you want. This can be your truth, but the fact is you have $9.42. And so you're not getting $10,000. You're not getting $5,000. You're not getting $25. You're getting $9.42. In other words, truth is objective. It is not a subjective feeling, emotion, thought, or wish. Truth is an objective reality. 
And so I wanted to start with this point to undergird this concept that there is truth. And it's important to realize that when it comes to understanding what truth is, it is objective. It remains true regardless of our thoughts, feelings, or desires. That's number one. Truth is objective. Truth is objective. Here's number two. Second thought is this. Number two, truth is timeless. Truth is timeless. Now, this is an important one. Truth is timeless. So on Wednesday nights, there's a group of about 20 of us that are going through a book study right now called The Strange New World. And in this book study, we're essentially um, analyzing why our culture is the way that it is. And so we're going through a book by Carl Truman. And in this book, we're, we're reading about philosophy, we're learning about history, and we're trying to peel back the layers of how we arrived at this current cultural time where everything is topsy-turvy and kind of crazy a little bit. And two weeks ago, we stumbled across the teachings of a guy by the name of Karl Marx. How many of you have heard that name? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah, a lot of you. Now, I think if I were to say Karl Marx, you're like, I know that name. But I think probably a lot of us are unfamiliar with, with what Marx actually teaches. And so here's one of the things that Mark, Marx teaches. Here's what Marx believes. Marx teaches that there is no transcendent realm. He teaches that there's no God, there's no sacred foundation, and as a result, it means that there is no moral order. Karl Marx teaches that the conditions human beings exist in is what determine who they are. I want to make sure you hear that. The conditions we exist in, according to Marx, is what determines who we are. And so he teaches that human nature is always in this state of flux and change. He teaches that morality is always in a state of moving. It's on a sliding scale. He teaches that our nature is so closely linked to our environment that when our environment changes, that's what changes our morality. Are you seeing this? So in simple terms, Marx taught that we're simply products of our environment. And when our environment changes, then that's what determines truth. That's what determines morality. And so in the end, here's what this means. It means that truth is relative to the culture, country, or environment that we are a part of. Truth is always changing to Marx. Now, this, again, is a very flawed view of looking at the world. Because, again, let's play this out logically. Here's what this means. It means that in the 1940s, when the Germans were living in a culture that viewed Jews in a certain very wicked way, according to Marx, this was justified because the environment of Germany, the economic structure, which is the term they always use, and the political leadership were all anti-Semitic. And since the environment is what determines truth, then the truth for Germany in the 40s is what was right for them. But today in 2022, because our environment is different, well, that's what makes it wrong. You see, the Holocaust wasn't wrong for the Germans, but it is wrong for us because our culture says it's wrong. This is ridiculous. And we can run this out all throughout human history. I mean, we can talk about the, the, the treatment of slaves, right? Slavery in the southern states in the 1600s and 1800s was right and moral for them, but in 2022, times have changed, so the truth changes. This view of morality is constantly on a sliding scale. It's constantly changing and moving based on the behavior. And whatever the behavior is, that's what makes it right and truthful. But that's not true. Truth is timeless. The treatment of slaves in the 1600s and the 1800s was just as wicked then as it is now. The Holocaust was just as wicked then as it is now. It doesn't matter on what your environment is. It doesn't matter what your culture says. It doesn't matter what PhDs say. It doesn't matter what doctors say. It doesn't matter what politicians say. What is wrong is wrong. Truth is timeless. What was wrong for somebody in AD2 is still wrong for us today in 2022. Truth is timeless. It's very important to recognize, especially in this culture, which we are on this sliding scale of morality. So that's number two. Here's my third thought. Number three, truth is available. Truth is available. You see, the irony of John 18 is that Pilate is asking what is truth in front of the living physical embodiment of truth. And that way, it just cracks me up a little bit. In John 1, 17, it says, For the law was given through Moses, and grace and truth came through Jesus. I want us to make sure we understand that. It says that grace and truth came through Jesus. Now, that is good news, and I want to tell you why. Because Jesus is not only the living embodiment of truth, but he's also the living embodiment of grace. And that really matters for you and me. 
And I'll tell you why. Because sometimes we need a lot of grace when it comes to digesting truth. Amen? All, all married men in here say amen. Yeah? Because I don't know about you, but there are times in my life when I am dead wrong about something. And i got to wrestle with being wrong with it. i got to really process what it means to be wrong with it. In other words, I need a lot of grace. I need a lot of grace. Jesus says, I am the living embodiment of grace, and I am the living embodiment of truth. Because, friends, in the end, the Christian life, can it all really be summed up in this grand attempt to pursue God's truth by marveling at the character of God? In the end, isn't that the Christian life? And aren't there times when, like, listen to this. I, I think this is so important. Aren't there times when our focus and our attention, we just get distracted and we realize that we're actually living in a world of deception? We're living in a world of deception and not in truth. And, and at least I'll speak for myself. There are moments where Karl Marx is actually on to something. He's actually on to something in teaching that our environment, our culture, our media, our entertainment, and everything that we consume on a daily basis gradually begin to chip away like a pickaxe at what truth really is. And it's a slow fade. It's such a slow fade. It's just little things here, little things there, little concessions that we give moment by moment. And then in the end, we realize, oh my goodness, I don't even know what truth is. It's deception. And before we know it, again, truth is not determined by God. Truth is determined by whatever way the wind is blowing, by whatever the doctors say, by whatever the politicians say, by whatever um, celebrities say, by whatever influential people say. And then we, 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 we take a step back and go, I don't even know what truth is. Truth doesn't exist. And then we just kind of live in this postmodern sludge of a world, just thinking that everything is subjective and nothing matters. Truth really matters, and, and, and I want to show you another example of how we know it matters so much from an example that I found this week that just blew my mind. It, it came from a guy by the name of Joseph Goebbels. Um, he was the Hitler's right-hand man during World War II, and he had the title of the Minister of Propaganda, and here's what he said. He said the quiet part out loud. Here's what he writes. He says, if you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. The lie can be maintained only for such time as the state can shield the people from the political, economic, and or military consequences of the lie. It thus becomes vitally important for the state to use all of its powers to repress dissent, for the truth is the mortal enemy of the lie, and thus, by extension, the truth is the greatest enemy of the state. He's right. Truth is powerful. Truth is very, very powerful. Goebbels knew it. The stories of the German people that were in support of the Nazi party hearing what was going on in concentration camps and realizing what it is that they were believing breaks my heart. Seeing the treatment of Jews, seeing the treatment of, of, of so many people, and then finally going, oh my goodness, I've been sold a lie. Truth matters. It matters a whole lot. But this is the world we're living in. There is an attack on truth. There is an attack on objective truth, on timeless truth that comes from God. And that, that right there, friends, this is why we need Jesus. This is why we need the Bible. This is why we need the truth. Because Jesus gives us his grace, but he also gives us his truth. Jesus said in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. In other words, Jesus makes his truth and he makes his grace available to you and me. And so when Pilate asks this question of what is truth, the answer is simple, Jesus. Jesus is the truth. And anything other than him, anything other than what we learn from this book, from the word of God, is deception. And so I have a question for you, and I want every single person in here, eyes up here, to listen to this question very seriously, because this question really matters. The question is this, what are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with him? Because that's the question. What are you going to do with Jesus? Because either Jesus is the objective, timeless truth, or he's not. So what do you do with that? 
What do you do with that? Where does that leave you? I'll show you what Pilate did. He walks away from Jesus, kind of scoffing, asking this whimsical question of what is truth, and here's what happens. Verse 38. After he'd said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, he says, I find no grounds for charging him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews mocking Jesus? But they shouted back, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas, he was a revolutionary. And so here it is. There's, there's Jesus out on this portico. There's Jesus on one side with a bruise on his face. No charge has been brought against him. Pilate found no guilt in him. There was no fault found in Jesus. No charges brought against him. And then to the other side was this man named Barabbas who was a revolutionary. What do we know about Barabbas? We know that he was essentially a domestic terrorist. Not a domestic terrorist who goes to a school board meeting and tries to protect his daughter, but a legitimate domestic terrorist. A guy who wanted to overthrow the Roman Empire, and not just that, wanted to overthrow Jewish leaders. This guy had blood on his hands. This guy was a revolutionary. A kind of guy that should not have been given an option to be free. And these are the choices. You have perfect, spotless, no complaints brought up against Jesus other than the fact that people just want him dead. The guy who's been healing blind people. The guy who's raised dead people. The guys who healed the woman of constant bleeding. The guy who's fed thousands of people. The guy who nobody can find any fault in. And then on the other side is Barabbas, whose rap sheet is long, bloody, violent, and clear guilt. And these are the choices. Jesus or Barabbas. And what do the people choose? They say, we want Barabbas. Give us the lie. Give us the deceiver. Give us the revolutionary. Give us the person who doesn't deserve to be set free. And what that resulted in is the person, the truth, Jesus, continuing on his journey to the cross. So the same question that, that, that the Jewish leaders were asked that day is the same question that I know, we got to ask each other. What do you do with Jesus? Because this is the world we're living in. We're living in a culture that's trying to sell us a bunch of Barabbases. That's trying to sell us a bunch of deceit, a bunch of lies, a bunch of things that are just not true. A bunch of cultural, social issues that are absolute nonsense. And then on the other hand, we have truth. Jesus. And our culture is shouting, give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas. But who do you want? Who are you crying out for? What are you going to do with Jesus? That's what matters. And so here's how I want to close our time. Can we all bow our heads in prayer? And I want to ask every single one of you, just very honestly, what are you going to do with Jesus in your life? What are you going to do with him? I think there's two groups of people here that I want to recognize and pray for. The first group is something that I think a lot of us can relate to. This is a group of people that has perhaps been inadvertently been taken by our culture. Maybe we've been deceived by our current times. We've been deceived by clever lies on social issues such as men can be women and women can be men. Perhaps we've accepted a lifestyle that disregards what Jesus did for us on the cross. And maybe today you realize for the first time in a long time that you desperately need the grace of God and the truth of God. Because your life has been wrought with deception at every single corner. And maybe today you say, God, you know what? I accept your grace. I believe you are truth. Renew my life. Restore my heart. I'm going to live my life for you in the truth, in the light, away from the darkness. I'm choosing Jesus over Barabbas. And then maybe there's a second group of us in here who've never believed the truth about Jesus. Maybe Jesus has just been a cool historical figure that we've seen taught at public schools. But outside of that, he's just, he, he's, he's, that's really it. There's nothing else about him that's super important. But today, for the first time, you truly believe that Jesus is genuinely, truly the only way, the only truth, and the only true, genuine way to experience eternal life. 
Maybe today is finally when you make the decision to become a Christian. Well, the good news is that it's never been easier. Right now, if this is you, all you got to do is pray right now in your heart or even out loud and say, I confess my sins and I repent of all my past failures. I believe that you are truth. I believe that you are the savior of the world. And I believe that I cannot go on living my life without you. My life is yours. Scripture says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. You will. And so if that's you and you just prayed that prayer, I want to welcome you into God's family. I want to welcome you into a family that is marked by truth and grace, that is not clouded in deceit and lies. And then for the first of us, the first group that I talked about, maybe you have, again, been taken, living in a world of deceit, disregarding the truth of Scripture, neglecting what God says about human nature, and instead feel more compelled to listen to headlines over the Word of God. Jesus, I lift all of these people up to you. I lift myself up to you. May we be a church that upholds truth. May we never be afraid to talk about truth. May we never grow tired of extending grace and truth. Father, you are so kind to us and very generous to us. And it's incredible that you even chose to give us truth in human form in the form of Jesus. Father, I pray that when the decisions in our life to choose deceit and lies, to choose Barabbas, or to choose you, truth and justice and hope and grace, Father, may we as individuals in your church here in Rogue River choose you every single time. May we never grow tired of doing good. May we never get exhausted from pursuing truth. And may we always, Lord, constantly come back to studying your character. May we constantly meditate on the word of God like the Bereans did. And may we constantly always be looking to you as the author and the perfecter and the finisher of our faith. Jesus, you are so good to us. We love you, Father. And we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.